I'd like to welcome John Fondine, who is the, the Arrows Center Archivist for United States Geological Survey. John um, has been with the USGS for since 1985 and served in a variety of roles. Uh, he has been the chief of uh, chief management of remotely sensed and cartographic science collections. In 2004 to 2007, he served as the acting USGS records officer, overseeing records management activities uh, for the bureau. He has published over 35 papers, articles on topics involving information systems, archiving records management, and has traveled all over the world, including South Africa, where I had a chance to work with uh, John on an international task group called um, Data at Risk, which John is the vice chair for that international group and primarily focused on scientific data that is at risk that spans from paper to all variety of media, which uh, certainly, uh, and not to forget that John and the National Archives, myself, we have been working on ingest of uh, digital orthoquad collections, and that is, for the first time, a big data collection for NARA to handle 20 terabytes, which is nothing if you saw the <laughs> scales there going up to petabytes. So without further ado, John Fondine, please. We'll, t we'll take the questions for both speakers after this. So. Thank you. As you've noticed from the program, I have uh, one of my more interesting titles, and I'll try to see if I can actually address that highfalutin title and direct it towards at least how my organization does preservation planning. So I will go through these elements, give you a little bit of context to where I'm coming from, and then try to have these all pointed towards our preservation plan. Where I sit is within the Department of Interior U.S. Geological Survey, and in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I literally call it Cornfield, USA, because we're not even in the city of Sioux Falls. We're 16 miles outside, and as you can see, corn and soybeans do basically enclose us. 60, uh, 600 staff support this facility. And it was established in 1972, so we have uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon as our cornerstone, kind of an interesting historical point there. Observational records are what we deal with, and there are different types of observational records. Ours are primarily dealing with two different platforms, one aerial and one satellite. These would be three different time periods from an airplane showing portions of DC that you can recognize. And you can probably start to see some uses for this. The time change would give you some differences if they've been building through that area. These were taken from a few miles up, uh, generally a little less than your typical airliner would travel from coast to coast. These are generally film, although in the most recent years they're starting to transition to entirely digital systems that would have geographics embedded in them but we have 100,000 rolls of film that goes back to 1939. And various forms of the geographic information or the finding aids were provided to us for those. And we're still dealing with them. Four film types, black and white, black and white infrared, that would be the thermal sort of the uh, elements that Brad was talking about in his uh, presentation. Natural color, that is what you and I would see with our eye, and then color infrared, which is an outgrowth of World War II technology, and I'll explain that a little bit more. But you could think about uh, urban planning, emergency response or transportation network uh, util utilization just from these images alone. So now ramping up to hundreds of miles in space, but looking back towards Earth, you would have these satellite platforms and you can very quickly see the aerial difference that these can provide. These are also what we would call observational records. They're always representations of the Earth. That's uh, an easier way to think about these from a certain time and then obviously over a geographic space. Environmental assessments, regional and global change analysis, energy and mineral uh, exploration, erosion, depositional changes are just some of the uses for these images. These are a little bit washed out, but they're over the 
DC area on your left is um, 1949 and on your right is 1961. So you could think about some of the changes that you could map from that. These are black and white. The human eye can typically see about seven shades of grayscale from that. You can do a lot of analysis, land, water, where the land, or where the water was, where it is now, how have changes been made, where they human induced, um, or just erosional. Now, color infrared, same relative area. It's a little bit, um, shocking to the eye to see all of this red. And if you can think of that as being all of the green growing vegetation, that's color infrared. It's showing the chlorophyll content in the plants. So thus the more bright and deep the red, such as Theodore Roosevelt Island, the more dense and well um, growing the vegetation is in that area. The connection to World War II is this type of photography you could tell where cut vegetation, shrubs, trees, bushes, had been placed over gun emplacements. The chlorophyll had stopped flowing. It would be pink, whereas maybe the rest of the forest was bright red. Something's different there, and that's why it's an outgrowth. It's very good for agriculture to determine where there's crop stress, because this is looking beyond the human eye capability, and we can start to see where the center pivots need to be turned on in potato farms in Idaho, or where pests have come in and even before you've realized the full stress impact on the plant it's shown in this type of imagery okay the value portion of my title really was trying to mask that i wanted to talk about appraisal process and i know that a lot of people take a step backward when you start getting to that where you're actually trying to review and put a value judgment on a collection and this is something that my organization hesitantly went into, but as we got into it farther and farther, we saw the value of doing this for our own benefit and for defending our decisions. We do this at, with a recognition that it's both an art and a science because you are trying to predict future value also. We look backwards as to current use, that uh, when a collection was originally done, what we do with it today, and what we think the science will be in its use in the future. This has been a confirmation of our missions for us. We had collections that were grandfathered to us in the 1970s, and our mission evolved over those four decades. And so it has been good for us to look at those We've done approximately 60 reviews in the last six years. 11 collections were disposed of based on that, and that is a huge cultural change for my organization. We used to be, um, well, we used to kid. If someone would call us up, at the end of the telephone call, we'd give them our shipping address and we'd receive a collection. We were pretty well open to taking on anything. It is now a required policy that any offer to us has to go through this appraisal process. And it is uh, fairly formal, has lots of levels of documentation. And regarding those offers, prior to this process, we didn't have a way to say no. And that sounds interesting, but from a government standpoint, you can see if a, maybe a taxpayer-funded organization came to us and we're in archives, so you must do good. We'd like you to take this. And for us to now have a process that we can go through and a justification that we can give to these offers, it, it has really uh, helped us quite a bit in justifying maybe we decline this offer. In times of budget um, reductions, which has been for the last several years, this, in my opinion, allows you to spend your resources in preservation and access on the collection that best match your mission objective of your organization. And I mentioned the documentation. We've been doing this long enough. We have had questions. Why did we dispose of this collection or why do you still have this collection? And we can defend that now. Our process involves including something we call gathering information and that's a 42 question set that is actually now part of uh, one of the NARA best practices on their website. We take all of that information, as much as we can gather about a collection, and bring that to a scientist who has relevant experience with 
a collection that we're reviewing and then ask them to give us answers to what was the collection used for originally, what would you use it for today, and what is the future value. They don't want to give us the future, but we require them to do that. We then bring this into a presentation for the manager that would be spending money on preservation access. We call that the day-to-day -day manager. Get their concurrence, we write a recommendation memo that goes to our center management. They need to write a memo to me then. Do they accept or reject the recommendation? And then we go to our headquarters and get programmatic support for the recommendation. Sounds like a lot, but we can actually do this. Um, we've gone through it in a two-month period before. It depends on the collection. Sometimes it's stretched to a year, depending on the politics and such. Access, we've talked about that a little bit in other presentations today. I challenge our management and our science staff, why do we provide ac or archival preservation support for something we do not intend to provide access to? And there are a few exceptions that have specific sunset dates, uh, restrictions, copyrights, and such, but for the most part, what my organization deals with is public domain data. So that's a valid question to ask them, why are you planning deep archiving? I don't even like that term in my organization, but I know that they mean keep it preserved, but don't provide access to it at all. We had a bit of um, shaking up in 2008. We were given a mandate that all of our data would be made available at no cost, openly available and free to the user. Prior to that, our satellite imagery was $600 per image. We have several million images. So you can imagine that was a multi-million dollar change in reimbursables to our organization of which USGS could accept money. It did not go to the Treasury. So that was a huge change for us. To give you an example of what a positive spin that became, Prior to 2008, the most we had ever distributed of satellite imagery in one year was 20,000 separate images. Since 2008, we have distributed more than 9 million images at no cost. A fairly good uh, example of a policy that worked out well. Adam Gerard from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations made this quote about this change. He said, the opening of the Landsat Archive to free web-based access is like giving a library card for the world's best library of earth conditions to everyone in the world. I thought that was quite unique in that concept of relating this opening to a library card. I brought this picture in just to show to the detail that we've taken access. Again, satellite images of a limited area at one time in space. So over DC as an example, since 1972, there are thousands of satellite images over this area. Your home has thousands. Primarily these are optical sensors, which means they go through the atmosphere and they run into clouds. Researchers typically, unless you're a climatologist, you do not want to deal with clouds. You want to look at the land surface, the vegetation, the bare earth, the regional planning. So, Technology has now allowed us to take all of these images and pull the smallest pixel, that is the smallest area you can see in the satellite image, and bring out the best pixels. So basically, find the ones that don't have clouds on it. And we've done this now for the lower 48 in Alaska, and we hope to do this on a global scale. So from a weekly period, a monthly period, a seasonal period, and an annual period, you'll always look at the best available imagery over the geographic areas. It's brought up a little question for me, though. This is made up of many different images and just portions of each of those images. And it dynamically can change as new imagery comes into play. That might be better than it was previously in place. So what is the record? The original images, of which there's many thousands, or this dynamically changing one. And yes, you can do snapshots, but this can change even daily. So it becomes quite of a challenge that um, basically management's pushed on me to solve, and we haven't got there yet.
Here's my air element, and it works well into previous presentations. I find that temperature and relative humidity monitoring is one of the easiest and, let, and yet the least um, institutionalized as I, I talked. And, and even within my own organization, as I visit our sites, and we have facilities in every state, in most states several, this is not tracked to the level that I think is sufficient. And I'd even argue that my own center really didn't get it too well until 2010, so only about three years ago. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we were using the paper dial that would have the temperature in one color and humidity in another. And I'd argue that that doesn't give a lot of analysis capability, especially um, if the pen gets off a little bit or it just seems to be one red, you know, continuous circle, you didn't see any variation and maybe you could tell, well, something was going on at that time. So we started investing in data loggers in 2010 and I've become to rely on that and, and discussions at lunch with a Smithsonian colleague, I will be looking at even evolving our current data logger um, hardware. We use 11 of these in a 28,000 square foot archive. And it, it's had some very good information for us to utilize with our facilities management. I can go with them with very specific details about when incidents occurred. Um, the, the data loggers we use give a 30 minute um, timestamp of temperature and humidity. So you get 48 readings per data logger per day. Currently we have, um, in three years, 410,000 readings so far that we can analyze. So this is the structure that I inherited. And this is the archive, this space of white and this space of white. The bright green four digit numbers are serial numbers of our data loggers. And then here are two HVAC units and then the years that they went to play. And that's a whole nother story because I was utilizing 30 plus year old excessed HVAC equipment. That is another federal agency thought we were done with them, my access it. We took it as an opportunity for whatever reason that was. <laughs> um, the folks that had to keep maintenance on those old ones said that it is well beyond its life. Through the data logger analysis, we determined we had a, two strong microclimates going on in, in the archives. This area has 40% humidity ranges in a year. And that's where we'd been storing film. <laughs> this area runs warmer than I would like. So those are two areas that I wanted to focus on. Working with facilities, in fact, the construction just started two weeks ago. This is being blocked off. All of the film records in here has been moved to this larger structure and we're going to basically slave this HVAC to this area and have two work on a smaller area. I would have never been able to get management, especially facilities management, to agree to this without very detailed analytical um, background information that I could support. Um, today, I can tell, for whatever reason, when we switch over from winter to summer operations, it affects the archives specifically in this area. And I can tell instantly when they do that in the spring. I don't get any forewarning that the facilities are going to do that, but I can tell in the readings exactly when they did it because the temperature and humidity will spike and it'll take about two and a half days to go back down to normal. This is all 11 data loggers composite over the 11, uh, or I should say over three years worth of time. And it's not, all positive. I mean, the overall temps are a little bit um, high. I deal primarily with black and white film, magnetic media, optical media, and color film. So specifically color film, I'm not doing such a good job, but the black and white, not too bad. The trend though, you can see there is a tailing down as you go to the right. And the other good thing is the width of those 11 loggers are narrowing. So we're starting to contain our range of temperatures a bit. And so we're we're headed in the right direction until I show you this slide. 
do you see any trends? <laughs> May through September. I'm in South Dakota, land of extremes. Um, I, I benefit from humidity. Uh, I also inherited a below ground archive. So I, I get some benefits from temperature. It's the opposite when you go to humidity being below ground. So I, I have some battles yet to, um, to overcome here. This darker green color you notice is the lowest of the lows and the highest of the highs. That's in that area that we're closing down. So I am hopeful that we've taken our worst case humidity area and we're going to um, eliminate that and then also spend more HVAC resources to try to narrow this down. My goal is 35% um, plus or minus 5%. That is my goal. And as you can see, I have some work to do there yet. And luckily my NARA archivist isn't in the room today, so I won't show this to him. We're also trying to learn from some of our colleagues around the world. We have data loggers in place at NOAA's National Climatic Data Center in Asheville, North Carolina. We have uh, one logger in an archive. These are facilities similar to my own, so they're doing uh, archiving of similar materials and observational data. Uh, Ottawa, Canada, we have two in Beijing. We have one in the United Kingdom and one in Brazil. So you can see we don't have a lot of data yet. We need at least another year to really get some analysis. But I think we're going to have some interesting discussions. There's stuff all over the place here, and, and we're going to learn collectively as we go down this path. Consciousness is really, and it, and it relates very well to what Ron was talking about. When my organization invests in media, and including copies today, we're managing over six petabytes of data. So when we go down a path of a media, it's costly. Even though relatively over the years, drives and media have come down, when we choose one or two, it's a costly venture for us because we're still talking volumes of media. And so my point here is I would hope, and I believe this is supported by Ron's thoughts, that um, you would really spend some time thinking about which media and not necessarily what is on an end display at your electronics store because it does make a difference. We actually spend a bit of resources every other year and do a, what we call offline archive media trade study. And by offline we mean we're not doing trade studies on robotic silo media. That's a different study that we do. But for the media that you would put in an archive or on a shelf that's not spinning, and we've done seven of these studies since 2001. And we use it to confirm we're on the right path, or maybe a technology is at the end of its life and we need to start considering another path. Um, it's been very useful. The medias on the yellow block are just some of the ones we have a, a fairly extensive experience with. And um, that's going back to the 19... 70s and 80s in some cases. But I wanted to relay the story of two archives that were very similar to my own organizations. They dealt with satellite imagery. One was in Europe and one in Canada. And they had both dedicated their archival material to an optical platter choice. And that company that manufactured that did not allow cross-licensing. So you went to that company only they went on a business. Both of these entities, the European and the Canadian, spent millions that they hadn't planned in a very short time to migrate their archives. And that taught us a big lesson of following media and trying to um, keep our best of it. I, I've always said we don't want to be on the bleeding edge, but we want to be kind of the next. Let someone else bleed a little bit, and we'll be the ones bandaged behind them. Um, it's harder to do that now. As Ron pointed out, technology is changing so fast, it's hard to tell bleeding edge from current technology. But that's one reason. We also felt that these sort of media, within a two-year period, we typically can capture the trends. 
whether that's right or not, but it, it's usually within 18 to 24 months we can tell if um, technologies have changed enough. And we, we have our own criteria. We publish this as I have that URL so that's available for others to look at. And we're not saying this is the technology to use. We're showing you the factors that were utilized to come to our decision. Your weighting may be different and you may have some additional criteria we didn't use. But we have published it to let others engage with us and we've had optical companies in London call us up and we've had very good discussions going back and forth and, and we learn from that engagement. So, it, and, and case in point, the outcome from our 2012 study that was released last month is for a technology that we're not planning to utilize. So even though the outcome of the study weighted this technology best, we're still using our current one because it reaffirmed that we're still on a good path, it's cost effective, the read-write times are good for us, and the overall costs are still in line with us. So it isn't necessarily that the study is published, it shows this technology, and we switch gears. It's more to confirm that we're on a right path or that we need to start looking down another technology road. Another point on media, and again, brought up, I don't have the backup, 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 but it is implied here that this is what I would recommend and it took us many years to get here. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we could only afford two media, two copies of our critical one-of-a-kind scientific observational data. In the 2000s, technology costs came down to the point that drives are so cheap that we don't buy warranty anymore. If we get two years of use out of them, we've played the odds and we, we won the cost battle there. That wasn't the case back in even the 90s where a drive would cost us $200,000 and we needed several drives. And we had to have several uh, contracts to support them. Our costs today are in the physical media. The drives are inconsequential to us in an overall cost model. But the cartridges alone, even though they hold terabytes, we go through the volume enough that it's still a cost factor for us. But it has come down enough that we can have a three copy minimum strategy across our center. That strategy would be that you would have one copy on spinning disk serving research community um, staff, which includes our own. Second is on either another spinning disk or on a separate system or it is in our archive physically. So both in the same building but never on the same machine. The third is on a tape and it's off-site. And currently we have a contract with NARA down in Lee Summit, Missouri. We store two petabytes down in their facility that uh, was mentioned this morning, they have a lot of mines in that area. Actually, there's some football, pro football connections to that. Um, Lamar Hunt, who used to own the Kansas City Chiefs, was in construction. He excavated a lot of the mines for limestone for construction. And then being the good business person he was, is now what? And he repurposed the mines. And um, our two petabytes I figure a costing the USG is about 50 cents a terabyte for storage. That's the best deal I've got going right now. They're not hot swappable, that's not uh, rollover, but they're safe. Um, I sit in Tornado Alley and uh, if something happens to us, I know we can rebuild. We're also, as Vivek mentioned, investigating using ERA for all of our data. So that would be several petabytes worth. We have done a test, as he mentioned, with 20 terabytes. We hope to, in the next few months, roll that up one scale to 200 terabytes, and then from there, go on to our larger collections. And so that could be, if everything works all right, the possible automatic rollover, that if our facility is wiped off the map for whatever reason, the data would be electronically available through ERA and research could go on.
one summary. I think you've gotten the um, background on, on the type of observational records that we deal with and they cannot be recreated. So that's part of the value judgment. You have to determine if there is another asset that would be better than the one you're evaluating even though they cannot be repeated. And consider having an appraisal process and, and doing that value judgment. I really think it can confirm your mission and it can give you um, support as you go forward for um, more budget uh, that you can indicate that you really have the collections that meet your mission. And also it's a means to politely say no to folks that offer you all sorts of things. Really evaluate your environment. I think there are tools available today that are cost effective and that can provide the analysis to allow you to work with your facilities and your, your organizational management to better your environment and, and also to determine where you ha might have problems. Manage your media. We even try to determine when we get batches of media in to try to log that so we can determine if certain batches had a problem and we can, once they're detected, we can pull and, and migrate um, entire batches. It, it, it's tough to do that, but we even go to that level where we can. And have as many copies as you can afford um, with the metadata relevant to them. And here would be my last pitch. Try to keep a long distance copy from your facility. And long distance is relative to your own organization. I try to think of what natural hazard do you have or hazards that you could go to a different region and they would not have that hazard. If it's hurricanes, tornadoes, pick a different one. More than likely you wouldn't have them both occur at the same time, you would hope. And I believe all of these elements can be part of a preservation plan. So thank you. <laughs>